Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place where I get to spoon feed you guys the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. Now, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a journal feed subscriber and so will not be receiving the full journal feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. If you'd like to get the whole podcast as well as access to the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember, we don't ever want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, just get in touch. We'll help you out. Now, this is the audio version of the past week's summaries, which were brought to you by our authors, Aaron Lacey, Clark Strunk, Megan Hilbert, Samuel Rouleau, Michael Stoker, and Clay Smith. Okay, let's skip straight to the third article. Titled Diagnosis of Acute Aortic Syndromes with Ultrasound and D-Dimer, the Profundus Study, out of the European Journal of Internal Medicine. In the FOMED podcast world, which I like to be very much involved with, as you can see, there's been a lot of talk about acute aortic syndromes over the last couple of months, how to diagnose them, when to look for them, what exactly to do about them. It's a very interesting topic, and it's a very difficult one. Anybody who comes in that sounds like a risky story, it would be too easy to just scan everybody. Which we don't want to do, but also we don't want to miss acute aortic syndromes because they're scary. And what falls under acute aortic syndromes? Well, a bunch of things, pretty much anything that goes terribly wrong with your aorta. A dissection, an intramural hematoma, a penetrating ulcer, all things scary to happen to a tube that carries pretty much all the blood that gets pumped out of your heart. What's good is that these aortic syndromes are rare. What's bad is that it makes them even harder to spot. One technique for trying to rule out the diagnosis has been to use the ADDRS score, which is a nifty little tool that you can find on MDCalc, which has been used to take risk factors about the patient, the history, and the exam to see if you should get a D-dimer, and then those together can hopefully rule out acute aortic syndromes. What's unfortunate is that it hasn't quite been good enough. It's been pretty good. Some of the sensitivities from these trials can be in the upper 90s, but they're not all necessarily that high. And this isn't necessarily outperforming clinician gestalt in a lot of cases. Now, the original ADDRS score, which is something that is externally validated, did not actually contain the D-dimer. But the advised trial added the D-dimer to it. Let's just be clear about that, that the original did not have D-dimer, but it has since been added, but that was not validated either. And here we are doing another thing, which isn't validating other things. We should do more trials that validate stuff, people, please. And what did this trial do? Well, it took ADDRS with a D-dimer over 500 or age-adjusted, and it added POCUS. This is interesting. I think already you should be focusing any of your patients that come in with chest pain. So this is hopefully something you're already doing. And this trial just formalized the approach together to help you rule out the diagnosis of acute aortic syndromes. So how did the protocol go for this study? Well, they did the risk score and they did a POCUS, a suprasternal and a parasternal view at the very least. And using those two things, they decided whether or not you ruled in the diagnosis and thus should get a CT scan or if you should get a D-dimer. Then if the D-dimer is positive, ruled in, get a scan. If it's negative, ruled out, not an acute aortic syndrome, look for an alternative diagnosis. This was a large validation on almost 2,000 patients, so quite a bit of work was done here. So what did they find? Well, they found that adding POCUS to this risk score was actually quite helpful. It resulted in 6% of the patients being moved from low risk over to high risk, and that's pretty important. This was a 20% net reclassification improvement. And of those 6% of patients who were moved to high risk because of the POCUS, they had a 39% chance of having an acute aortic syndrome, which is huge specificity for this kind of thing. In the low-risk group, which used an age-adjusted D-dimer, there was a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 59%. In the low-risk group, to rule out the diagnosis, There was a 100% sensitivity using an age-adjusted D-dimer and a 59% specificity. 
So adding POCUS to the ADD risk score seemed to be quite an improvement, something I like to see, especially since I like to POCUS. What I tried to figure out is exactly which POCUS views were actually the most useful. I don't do that much suprasternal POCUS. I do the parasternal long all the time, but suprasternal, not that much, mostly because I find it's awkward and kind of difficult to do, and it's hard to really see the aorta very well in a lot of patients. So I dug into the supplementals and I tried to see exactly which POCUS view people were actually finding the relevant findings on, and unfortunately the authors did not report that. They did show me though that they were doing a lot of other POCUS views. Namely, they were doing a lot of abdominal aorta scans, they were doing a lot of five or six chamber apical views, and a lot of subcostal four chamber views, as well as some echoing of the neck or leg vessels. So until this is clarified, I think that you should be looking at more than just the parasternal long and the suprasternal, because the majority of other patients also had other places pocused. And what are you looking for on POCUS? Well, you're looking for either direct signs of aortic pathology, that's an intimal flap, thickening of the wall, or outpouching, or you can also look for indirect signs, so a thoracic aortic dilatation, pericardial effusion, moderate aortic valve regurgitation. And these findings can be incorporated into this lovely protocol, which seemed to be very useful and is now derived from a well-done study. In a spoonful, adding POCUS to the ADD risk score might actually be worth your while. Now all we need is validation. And then we skip to the fifth article, titled Evaluation of Basic Life Support Interventions for Foreign Body Airway Obstructions, a Population-Based Cohort Study out of the journal Resuscitation. All right, guys, this trial actually blew my mind and will change my practice. I cannot believe I did not already know this. This was an observational cohort study which compared the efficacy of basic life support measures for foreign body airway obstructions. The three things they compared were abdominal thrusts, that's the Heimlich maneuver, back blows, and chest compressions. They had 709 patients of all ages who required these interventions. All this data was from a pre-hospital system in Alberta, Canada. The primary outcome was relief of the airway obstruction, and the secondary outcome was survival to discharge and intervention-associated injuries. The largest group of patients were elderly patients over the age of 65, that was about a third of the total cohort, and then the next largest group were patients one year old or less, which was about another 200 patients. In all comers across all the groups, the odds of airway obstruction relief was better with back blows compared to abdominal thrusts or chest compressions. Chest compressions did particularly poorly in adjusted odds ratio of 0.11 compared with back blows. Abdominal thrusts did a fair amount better, but still very poorly in adjusted odds ratio of 0.55. That's barely better than half. But that's just for relief of the obstruction if you actually look at survival to discharge, then there is no significant difference between back blows and abdominal thrusts, the Heimlich maneuver. If you compare that to chest compressions, then things are not going well. Also, most of the injuries were associated with chest compressions, and none were associated with back blows. Another thing that's very important to keep in mind was that if the first intervention was performed by someone from the ambulance service, there was a significant higher risk of mortality, 23% versus 13%, which means that bystanders should indeed definitely try to help relieve an airway obstruction caused by foreign bodies. And now we seem to show from this trial that back blows are the easiest, not just the easiest, the best thing to do. They are also the easiest. I think that if back blows is the go-to recommendation for people, that people are going to be more likely to deliver this intervention. Not everybody's necessarily comfortable trying to do the Heimlich maneuver, and not everybody's anatomy is terribly amenable to doing the Heimlich maneuver. Sorry, abdominal thrusts. However, you can hit anybody on the back. What they recommend is that you kind of lean the patient over and just hit them right between the shoulder blades with the palm of your hand and just go for it. This has always been the recommendation for children under one year old as far as 
I know for a long time as I've known it. However, I've always thought that abdominal thrusts were the go-to in adults, which is actually the recommendation from the American Heart Association. But as our author Clay points out, this is not the recommendation from a whole host of other people. Apparently, I've not been reading their basic life support recommendations. That's right, the American Red Cross, British Red Cross, ILCOR, and the ERC all recommend back blows as the first thing for any conscious choking victim. If the patient falls unconscious, of course, this is a different story entirely. I'm certified to teach advanced cardiac life support, but not basic life support, so I don't do much teaching of basic life support. However, it will now become my go-to maneuver to relieve a foreign body airway obstruction with back blows, and it will also be the maneuver that I recommend to my patients and my family. So in a spoonful, back blows outperformed abdominal thrusts and chest compressions in the successful clearance of -of out-of-hospital foreign body airway obstructions, Back blows are now my go-to, not just in children less than one year old, but in big children as well. All right, that's all the articles we have from this week. Let's do a quick wrap-up of everything we covered. Then we looked at the third article, which added POCUS and an age-adjusted D-dimer to the aortic dissection detection risk score. And this seems to be the best iteration of this as an algorithm for ruling out acute aortic syndromes that I've seen so far. And then from the fifth article, back blows outperform abdominal thrusts and chest compressions for relief of foreign body airway obstructions. Again, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not a part of the member's feed, and so you missed three articles from this past week. I just told you two, but there were three more on top of that. What were they about? Well, one of them was about the best way to use a bougie. Another article was a reanalysis of the Clover's trial and exactly which subgroup of patients it might be beneficial to do restricted fluids for sepsis on. And then we looked at a trial which looked at the patient's rate of filling their prescriptions when prescribed doxycycline for chlamydial infections. The results will scare you. They scared me. Links to all the original articles can be found at journalfeed.org or through the links in your show notes. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.